Um, we're going to be in Isaiah tonight, so for those who like to dig deep and, and read in their own translation, I'm going to probably read in the New King James for the most part tonight, but I am going to hit the NLT uh, once or twice, and of course, I got to hit the message, the MSG. So uh, if that helps, if you like to sync up, if you're watching online and you have a chance to do that, please, uh, please do that. All right. Christopher Green. What's up, buddy? Good to see you. Sarah Townsend's here. Lily is missing Mercy. You know, I wanted to bring Mercy out to show you. She fell asleep on the way to my office. She's asleep in the car. So Maren's sitting out in the car with her. Uh, so if she wakes up, I'll bring her in because she, she will brighten your day. Uh, it's only been 10 days, but she's grown about a foot and she's got this big blonde curly hair going today. So I can't wait to, hopefully you'll be able to see her before we go. Hey, Catherine, how you doing? Hey, Gail. So good to see you guys. Yes, please chime in. This is interactive, okay? This is just like Wednesday night. Very low-key, very informal. Um, if you have questions or comments, I may see them during this, but I'll be concentrating on the word and, and uh, some of my notes. And then uh, after we dismiss here, y'all feel free to stick around and uh, talk to each other, chat, share prayer requests, share scriptures that have spoken to you during this week. You don't have to, you don't have to go home. You can hang out here uh, even after we finish. David Fry. Hey, Pastor David Fry over at Calvary Raleigh. What's up, brother? So good to see you. Doing a great job over at your church. Love you guys. Linda Young. Hey, Linda Young. Sarah Townsend. All right. Wow. You guys are coming in like crazy. All right. Awesome. Well, tonight it's going to be in Isaiah. And uh, again, feel free to comment, share your prayer requests. Let us know how you're doing during these strange times. Um, I, heard, I heard a really cool uh, possibility. I don't know how this clampdown is going to work. And I know that Wake County may, may issue a shelter in place type thing in the next few hours or day or two. I don't know how that'll play out, but Amy had a great idea. Tell me if you like this. If you like this, comment and let us know. You know, on Wednesday nights, we usually do our refuel meal and refuel uh, Bible study. And I thought, you know what? What if we do a meal all together, but online? And even better, I know Bill, Bill Hagen, as Pastor Bill's going to love it. What if we have Shannon cook a meal? She gives you the ingredients, maybe tweets those out on Monday or Tuesday. You go get the ingredients, right? And this is what she said. Post them out, very simple stuff, maybe stuff you got in your in your uh, kitchen already. And then at six, we go live in the kitchen and one of one of the people who aren't in quarantine, maybe a family member of hers who can be close and can film her cooking. We all cook together and have like an eat and chat with Pastor Matt, do a meal from six to six thirty, and then eat together after that. Wouldn't that be cool? Just live stream some of Shannon's cooking. I think that'd be awesome. So if you like that, let's put pressure on her. No pressure, Shannon. Yeah, she says no. She, so. she yeah, Shannon Shannon doesn't like to be live and, and this is weird. It's hard. It, it's, uh, you hope y'all praying for me like I'm praying for you because it's tough talking to this little dot right there and interacting. And I'm trying to read as fast as I can with you guys. All right, let me make sure. Hey, Mimi, how you doing? Tracy and Dennis are with Linda. Tracy and Dennis are with Linda. All right, awesome. There's Priscilla. Jay Morris, what's up, buddy? Hey, Ruthie again. Linda, okay, yeah, yeah, see that? Jennifer likes that idea. Cool. She's a top fan. Look at that. Her and Ruthie. Very cool. Tabitha, another top fan. Fun idea. You like that? Hey, Kathy Oaks. How are you? Happy birthday. Thomas Rossiano. He's playing bass right now in his house. I don't know if that's true or not, but I like to picture him playing bass because he's awesome. From and from <laughs> Shannon is already live tweeting uh, emojis with giant eyes saying, what? What have we done? So Facepalm. <laughs> with a facepalm. <laughs> You're welcome, Shannon. Love you. All right. Everybody just about in? All right, find Isaiah. And uh, we're going to discuss something that I think we can all relate to tonight. Growing weary. Growing weary. And uh, weary of the quarantine. Weary of worrying about the future. Wearing about being cooped up with your kids another day. Love the kids, but they're probably not used to being with all of us this much. All in a, in a tight space. So if that's you, tonight Isaiah has a word for you. I'm excited. What's up, Hayden? How you doing, buddy? Mimi Holland. I saw Mimi. Yeah, Mimi's there. Thomas, good, good. All right. Hey, Jerry. Good to see you and Dina. Before we begin, let's pray, okay? Just right where you are, let's just bow together. God, you are good because you are sovereign, and nothing catches you off guard. And we pray tonight that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, our mentor. Translate the word to our heart tonight, God. Help us not to miss anything. Reveal deep truths, even if it's a passage we may have read a dozen times or more in our life. You still have vast, unsearchable truth to reveal to us. So, God, we pray you would do that. Across the miles, thank you for this church that we can unite. Bless this time. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. All right. So, as always, before you read the scripture, it's always great to set the context. Anytime you do a Bible study, context is key. We try not to take little context, uh, little verses out of, you know, scripture and apply them always to today and expect them to be a perfect match because some things could be for a specific people or a specific time. So, what's happening here in Isaiah, we're going to be uh, in chapter 40, is, see if this sounds kind of familiar, you know, the nation of Israel is starting to grumble. And they're starting to complain. They have a complaint against God. They're wondering if he's still there, you know, because they're starting to wonder, listen, God, why are all these things happening? Um, are you no longer concerned about us? Have you forgotten about us? What, what is this? What, what, what is going on? And so the, the prophet Isaiah comes along and he reminds him, he says, ho, 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 God hadn't forgotten you. He, he's right here. He's your creator. He's your sustainer. And to think otherwise is, is foolishness. God is actively involved. He rules the nations. Nothing surprises him. He hasn't forgotten about you. Unlike us, he hasn't grown old or weak or weary. Maybe we have. And I thought, you know what? What, what, a, what a powerful passage. For all of us who have grown tired and grown weak and weary, wondering about things. When's, when's life going to return back to normal? What is normal? Is this a new normal? Well, for all of you, there is hope. And I'm so excited to do this, okay? So let's start in verse 28, starting in Isaiah chapter 40. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even the youths, 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 that's a tough word, youths, even the youths will become weak and tired. And young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That's awesome. But check out the message translation. If you're following along online, click over to uh, the MSG translation. This is, this is so awesome. It says this. Why would you ever complain, O Jacob, or whine, Israel? Why are you whining? I love that. Saying... God has lost track of me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care what happens anymore. Don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. God lasts. He's the creator of all you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out. He doesn't pause to catch his breath. And he knows everything, inside and out. He energizes those who get tired. He gives fresh strength to the dropouts. For even young people tire and drop out. Young folk in their prime stumble and fall. But those who wait upon God get fresh strength. I love that. They spread their wings and they soar like eagles. They run and they don't get tired. They walk and they don't lag behind. Isn't that great? Now here's a hidden gem, okay? A lot of people miss this because you've read this a thousand times or heard this in your life. Don't miss what's hiding in plain sight. The fact that our strength even needs to be renewed implies that we have a weakness. An inherent weakness that is inescapable. Do we like to admit that we have a weakness? I mean, think about that. No one does, but it's true. And this scripture is pointing to us, telling us there is a huge contrast between our human weakness and God's strength. And God is coming along saying, even the strongest among you are going to grow tired. You're going to grow weary, especially if you're in a quarantine and you've gone through all your snacks. Remember, when you were really young, you felt invincible, right? You were like, woohoo, I can do anything. It's great. Uh, you know, has anyone here ever chaperoned a youth lock in? You want to talk about <laughs> you want to talk about energy. I remember chaperoning them in my 20s. I was like, all right, we can do this. We can hang out all night. It's gonna be fun. And I remember chaperoning some in my 30s. I was like, man, are these kids ever gonna go to sleep? And then I remember chaperoning them in my 40s. And there's a big difference. And you're thinking, they're never going to quit. But something glorious happens. The Krispy Kreme sugar high crashes. And they fall. And all those who are bragging, oh, we're going to stay up all night. It's going to be great. We're going to go out there. You're going to do this. You know? And about 4 o'clock, and they're out. And you're like, oh, yeah. See, even the youth fall weary. You know, maybe you've got a young kid who's got a ton of energy. Maybe their nickname is the human tornado. I don't know. I'm just speaking hypothetically. And maybe, maybe that person's like, I can't do it. You know, I had all this energy, but now I got to clean my room. I just don't have the energy. I'm like, really? You sure? I'm so tired, Dad. I just, I just, I got to go to, I... well, that's a shame because Hannah just texted and said, do you want to go play soccer? What? Yeah, I got energy. Let's go. We can do it. Uh, caught you. 
See, even the youngest among us That's have, cold. have, <laughs> do I? That's cold. cold. You like that? <laughs> right, so here's the thing. I have good news tonight and I have bad news. What do you want first? All right, I usually give the good news first, but I know you want the bad news. So the bad news is the brutal, honest truth here. Even the strongest of us is weak, inherently. Even the strongest, the mankind, even at his strongest, is weak. When the sin curse entered the scene and we began to reap the penalty for all that came, all the inherent weakness and helplessness, this points to youth and their physical strength. Those who even seem strong will fall. And now what I like about this is this physical picture actually points to a spiritual picture. And you're probably experiencing this right now. There's physical weariness, which a lot of us have after an exhausting day, but there's also spiritual weariness and mental weariness, a, a heaviness that comes. Sometimes when you're being cooped up all day with people, you find yourself weary and you're like, what did I do? Why am I tired? I don't understand. I haven't done anything physically. I don't get this. Well, there's a weariness that comes with this. The dangerous part is when spiritual weariness and physical weariness come together. And they come at the same time. Anyone remember the great Christian movie, probably the greatest movie of all time, Rocky IV? Y'all remember Rocky IV? This is my favorite guy right here. What's, what's this guy's name? Anybody remember him? Oh, yeah. Ivan Drago, right? Love it. I love it. Strong Russian, I must break you, right? Or today, I want your toilet paper. That's what Ivan Drago is all about. This lumbering giant, and he's so strong. I loved it. Growing up in the 80s, I was watching this movie, and think about this. He's bigger than Rocky. He's stronger than Rocky. He's younger than Rocky. He's quicker than Rocky. He's in the prime of his life. He has absolutely everything going, but even this unbeatable giant falls. Even this seemingly invincible giant, his strength begins to wane, and about halfway through the bout, he gets cut. And I remember the guy in the corner, Rocky's coach, like, you see, he's not a machine. He's a man, just like you, and he can't be beaten. And about halfway through, something happens, and we see this beautiful thing. This huge giant starts to get tough. Look how big he is. That's awesome. And Rocky is able to topple this massive giant. Even the seemingly strong among us will eventually grow weak and tired. All right, so that's the bad news. But the good news is this. The good news is those who wait upon the Lord, those who wait and trust in him, will have their strength renewed. Sweet. All right. We've got our strength renewed. Let's go. Bible study over. Not so fast, my friend. As you study this, look closer. Who receives the strength? Is it everybody? Look very, the, the verse is very specific, and that's something that I think a lot of us miss. It says, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. It's not everybody. Not everybody's waiting on the Lord. It's not all men. It's not all women. It's not all kids. Those who wait upon the Lord. In fact, the original language here indicates that this idea of waiting actually is a looking forward to and expecting, a looking up to God, desiring, saying, Lord, would you send the strength I need it in open communion? How many of us are doing that? You know, I love to stop periodically and, and say, how you doing with that, church? Because the text doesn't say those that wait upon the Lord, eh, maybe, maybe their strength will be renewed. Maybe not. Well, it will be unless you are in a weird situation in the world and People are quarantining and hoarding toilet paper. Then I don't know if I've got enough strength for that. God's promises are true. Why do we believe some promises, but we have trouble with this one? Why do we not go to him with our weariness? You know, this is a promise to have our strength renewed and restored like the eagle. You know, we love to pick and choose which ones we believe. Look at the example of Israel. Israel, when they finally were released from, from Egypt and they began their long march back, Remember, as they came to the Red Sea, it was a dead end, and they panicked. And they're like, what are we doing? Have you brought us out here to die? I don't understand. The Red Sea was blocking them in front. Pharaoh's army was coming down hard behind them, and they were trapped. And man, you know they were tired. They were tired. They, they were marching through the night. They were scared. And I would imagine they needed their strength renewed in a major way. Humanly speaking, their situation was hopeless. Kind of sounds familiar. To a lot of people who don't have faith, they're just like, man, it's hopeless, and they're running around, and they think that it's that we're all going to be dead by noon tomorrow. And you know, check out what Moses said as he waited on the Lord in verse thirteen. He says, "Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord, and what He will bring you today." These Egyptians that you see today, I love this. You will never see again. What a promise! 
That is powerful. The Lord will fight for you. I love this. You need only to be still. There it is. Just wait and watch. And we all know what happened next. The sea parted. Here they come. This is so amazing. This isn't a fairy tale. This is something that is historically beautiful and a promise. God delivered them. He opened up the sea. They waited for him and he could pass through. But here's the thing. It didn't stop here. Look what happens to the enemies. Not only does God provide a way of escape for them, he took care of those who were coming after him. He took care of the enemies and he swept them all away. So let me ask this. Why? Why did God move so powerfully then, but maybe not in our life today? Why did God move so powerfully? What happens when we wait on the Lord? See, to wait on the Lord reveals two key things. If you're taking notes tonight, this is your first big one. Waiting on the Lord forces us to walk in humility. It really does. Waiting on the Lord forces us to walk in humility, to acknowledge we can't save ourselves. We just can't, you know? This is, this is so important because it eliminates pride. It's not about us. It's, it's about Christ, right? It's never been about us. It's about our awesome, loving, heavenly Father who rode away into the story for us to come to know him, all right? So the wait upon the Lord for strength, for deliverance, it reveals two key things. The first one is it forces us to walk in humility. The second one is it forces us to rely on God. Woo! It forces us to recognize and confess our weaknesses and our dependence on God. Now let me ask this. Do we like to do that? Do we like to admit? I'll tell you what, if this coronavirus hasn't taught us anything, it has taught us that we are not in control. It is confirmed. Man, my limited, what I thought we could control our happy life, we thought we had a good rhythm going and everything, and a lot of people, man, I tell you, there's a lot of people who, God's got their attention right now. They're, they're checking it out. Record attendance, people searching, you know, is this the end of time? Is this, what, what, what is going on? It forces us to rely on God when we stop and we wait. And we don't like to do this because no one likes to admit that they're broken. You know, think about that. Try this. If you're going to be looking for a job soon, I want you to take your resume, print it out, and at the top of your resume, I want you to put just a giant big in red Sharpie, just write, I'm a broken mess. <laughs> All right? I'm a broken mess. Let, let that be your header on your resume, and then hand that in, okay? And then when you sit down for your job interview, and he asks you to tell you about it, I want you to interrupt him and say, listen, before we get started, I just thought I'd share with you my list of weaknesses. I'm going to lead with that. How about some weaknesses here? Let's start with that. Nobody does that because we don't want to show that. That's, that's, so if you need power, you need strength, and you're tired, you need, you need deliverance, or maybe you need peace, Scripture is telling us that is found when we get in his presence and we wait on him. And I'm going to show you how to do that before we wrap up tonight, okay? But, but I want to point out a hidden gem here that is so obvious we gloss right over it, okay? This is what I want you to, to take away for the week. Waiting on the Lord is what releases his power in your life. Waiting on the Lord is what releases his peace, his deliverance, his strength. All of, everything you need is found in the Lord's presence. But let's be honest, our problem is we never wait on him. We go about our business, we're busy, I'll catch you on the flip side, God. I'll throw up a quick 30-second prayer in my car while I'm shaving, eat my Krispy Kremes. By the way, I've seen some of you, you've been going through your snacks awfully fast. Your quarantine snacks are gone. I hear that. All right. Hey, Elliot. Hey, Jeremy Lane. What's up, Katie? Let me stop and say hi to, you, to a few of these. Hey, Karen Miller. Joe Kisselberg. What's up, buddy? And all right. Good, good, good. Yes, Ivan Drago. You caught it. Awesome. All right. Are you all still with me? Everybody still here? Waiting on the Lord releases his power in your life. If you think that you're in God's waiting room right now and you're, you're kind of weary and you're wondering, I want you to know that you are in such good company. Joseph waited 13 years. Abraham waited 25 years. Moses waited 40 years. And Jesus, the Lord himself, waited 30 years before even beginning his public ministry. Think about that. So if God's making you wait, just know that you are in good company. Now, I don't want to just focus on just Old Testament I want to look at the New Testament. We're going to go over to uh, Corinthians here, 2 Corinthians, and we're going to look at the Apostle Paul for a second. Everybody doing good? 
the Apostle Paul, one of my favorite examples, because he's one of the greatest examples of a transfiguration you've ever seen. He's, he's just such, a, such an awesome inspiration. And I want you to listen to this back and forth conversation that we get to eavesdrop on between God and Paul. And anytime God allows us to kind of pull up a little chair here and get real close and listen to Paul talk with God, it's awesome. It's powerful. This is so cool, okay? This is so revealing of how you and I should wait on the Lord and how we should handle adversity and tough times, okay? Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Most of us have heard about that. If you're new to the faith or maybe you're not a, a member of an active church or anything right now, welcome to you. Catch up. Paul, great guy, had a big conversion experience, but he had this thorn in his flesh, something that bothered him, not necessarily an actual rosebush thorn poking him in his rib, but something that bothered him terribly. Scripture doesn't tell us exactly what it was. We think we have some idea. I won't go into that now. What's important is we know it bothered him because he asked God specifically to remove it, and not just once or twice, but three times. That's just that we know of in Scripture. Three times he prayed, God, would you please remove this thorn? All right, so, so there's a lesson right there. There's a freebie for you. Keep asking. Notice what Paul did. That's not even a, a note for tonight, but keep asking, keep knocking, stay persistent with the Lord. Because Paul did. He asked once, twice, three times a lady right there. And guess what? God answered his prayer, but not by removing the thorn. God answered his prayer, but it wasn't what Paul was expecting. God answered his prayer not by removing the thorn. Look at God's answer to Paul's request. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. For my strength, this is God's strength, is made perfect in weakness. Hmm. The New Living Translation puts it like this. Check this out. My grace is all you need. For my power works best in your weakness. Y'all, that is 100% the opposite of human logic today. Worldly wisdom. That is not what we are taught. We are not taught that kind of humility. In fact, the verb here used in the Greek is an active present tense. It's saying that his strength is always available. It's always present. It is always available and active to those who need help in any tough situation. Okay, so Paul is hurting. He's in a rough time. He's quarantined. He's got no toilet paper. He has no Twinkies. He's got nothing. And he's got this thorn in his flesh. But he knew God's provision was and is going to be sufficient. And his faith never wavered. How about you? That's powerful. What about you when we're weary and we're hurting and we're suffering? It's not easy to remember to rely on his grace. I get it. And that is the next lesson for us. Sometimes when we face these difficulties in our life, God doesn't necessarily remove the difficulty from us. In fact, he doesn't necessarily remove us from the difficulty. He can, but he does give us strength. That's his promise. It's not the bridge over troubled water. It's the bridge through troubled water, right? Tough times reveal a lot about us, don't they? The stress, the anxiety from the quarantine, they are revealing a lot about your character right now, aren't they? In your family, they're revealing a lot about your kids, revealing a lot about your, yourself, your spouse, how you relate. Some of it's good, some of it, you think, man, I thought I was deeper than that. I thought I was better than that. If you're feeling that way, it's okay. I've been there. Remember, you're safe here. Just because this is online doesn't mean you're not safe, okay? It's the potter's hand. We get to take our masks off. We don't have to pretend we got it all together. That's one of the things I love about you guys is we can just be authentic, just be real and say, man, I don't, I don't have it all together. I got room to grow. Anybody remember this guy? Anybody know who this is right here? If you do, chime in and just uh, send a little comment. I love baseball. Baseball is, is amazing. And the guy, we're going to come back to him. He went through a tough time, actually a series of tough times, some tragedies. But uh, a few years ago, the Bartons invited us to go to our very first baseball game. You remember this? Yeah, yeah. Carolina Mudcats, Mudcat Stadium. And I love it. It was awesome. We had a great time. I think it was Thirsty Thursday. We got free uh, Diet Cokes or Dollar Coke, Dollar Coke, but they give you a little Dixie cup, so you got to keep going back and forth. That's probably why you're thirsty. It was Milo's birthday. How old was he? Seven, six, four. No. It wasn't that long ago. All right. So we're at Mudcat State. I'm going somewhere with this. Okay, this is good. You're going to like this. I'm, 
I met Mudcat today. We're walking in. We got Leanne and Elliot and Elias and, and Hannah were there. I think everybody was there, right? All both both families. I'm having a great time walking up. And then, you know me, I'm hungry. I want some more hot dogs. So I get up. I say, Elliot, let's go get some more food. Done. So we start walking down and we're getting our food. And I noticed this <laughs> this cage. Yeah, Elliot, Mudcats. I see you, buddy. I noticed this this uh, pitching cage. You know what I'm talking about? Where they give you a ball. You, you give the guy like five bucks and he gives you like a ball or two. And you wind up and you throw it as fast as you can and you measure your speed. Well, I was with Elliot, you know, and I was like, hey, Elliot, you're, you're pretty athletic. You know, you think we could do this? We could probably do it. He's like, yeah, man, let's do this. Hold my coat. So, so he hands me his stuff. He, he goes, don't laugh. Don't laugh. This is painful to me. He hands him, hands his food to me. Elliot. Pays the guy five bucks, gives him two, two or three balls. I forget which one it was. You know, he does this a couple times. And I'm like, okay, so maybe I need to do that too, right? I'm a couple years older than Elliot, give or take. And uh, I'm watching. I'm like, okay, this is going to be awesome. Without doing anything more than a couple warm-ups, Elliot turns, looks, and hurls that ball. I mean, it's like, pop, into that backdrop. And we all look over at the little clock and see the same. It was like, I forget. It was ridiculous. It was like. 70, 80 miles an hour, maybe that. I don't know. You, maybe you remember Elliot. It was a lot. And I was like, ooh, all right. I got more cut out. I'm not going to get shown up by Elliot. That's not going to happen. He gets another ball. Swap. Boom. Like 85. It was ridiculous. I was like, what is this? You know, now I really, so, you know, he doesn't see me, but I'm behind him. I'm like, I'm warming up, man. I'm doing <laughs> yoga, Pilates. I'm trying to do everything I can. I got a little, little bit of sweat coming down my, my brow. Just I'm like, oh, okay. All right, we got to bring it. It's okay. I lift weights. We can do this. We'll just power through it. Throws the next ball. Uh, it, was, it was crazy. Each time he's getting faster, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this ball, and I'm going to give it all I got. And I wind up, and I throw that thing as hard as I can. 32 miles an hour. <laughs> 32 miles an hour. I was like, oh, so your clock's broken. Give me another ball. Y'all give me another ball. 31. I'm going backwards. Give me another ball. Here, take another $5. I'm, I'm going to do this. I said, this is it. I'm going to give it all I got. I take my ball, and I wind up, and I even do the pitcher thing, you know, and I'm, doing, I'm going to give it everything I've got. I, y'all, I throw that thing so hard, my shoulder pops. I don't know what happened. And I sling it so the blood runs into the finger. It stings. You ever done that? The centrifugal force? I'm throwing that thing. And I don't even stand upright when it's done. And finally, I look up. 29 miles an hour. It's like, I couldn't believe it. It was awful. I tell you that story just because it has no relevance at all. Anyway, all right, let's go back to this. This is, you know who it is? Dave Dravecki. Yep. This is one of the most incredible stories. And I really, all kidding aside, I am going somewhere with this. He was the pitcher for the San Francisco Giants. And he had such promise. When he first started, within his second year, he was already on the All-Stars. All right? He made his All-Star game. And he was pitching. And he was having an awesome year. And then, all of a sudden, in his second year, he gets the heartbreaking news that they found a cancerous tumor in his throwing arm. I mean, a bad one. And it had to be operated on. So they operated on it, and they had to remove part of his deltoid muscle, which is part of the stuff that gives you your, your speed and your velocity and all that stuff. And doctor said, you probably will never pitch again. All right, that was the first blow. And you would think that would probably be the end of the story. And enough tragedy for a major league pitcher who had only been able to go a couple years. But he was determined to have his career come back and get it back on track. So he goes through some incredible, grueling rehab regimens. I mean, it, it's brutal. And Dave Dravecki returns to baseball. And people are so happy. And they're cheering. And he's going crazy. And he's pitching in Olympic Stadium against the Expos. And as he's pitching, about the third, fourth inning, he starts complaining of arm pain. He's like, man, what's going on? You know what? Like that Pastor Matt guy at Mudcat Stadium? I'm going to power through this. And he starts throwing harder and harder, not letting up. And in the sixth inning, it happened. I won't go into detail, but tragedy struck. In fact... Tim Raines comes to the plate, and he's getting ready to bat, and Dravecki comes out of the windup, and he throws the ball so hard, he immediately drops to the pitcher's mound. The trainers heard what happened, and they ran so fast. Both dugout trainers emptied, and they ran to the mound 
to, to rush to his aid. It was one of the most shocking moments in all of professional uh, baseball history. And his, his humorous bone had snapped. As you can probably figure this out. And he would miss the rest of the season. And you think, poor guy. That's tragic. I bet that guy's weary. But his story doesn't end there. He begins to heal. His team keeps doing well, even without him. In fact, they go on to the National League uh, Championship and win the pennant over the Chicago Cubs. In their celebration, Dave Dravecki runs out to celebrate with his team. And in the joyous up and high-fiving and stuff, he breaks his arm again. Not even playing. He breaks his arm again. This is a guy who loves the Lord. Who, you know, why is all this tragedy happening to him? This time, there would be no comeback, though. What would happen was he would eventually realize that complications are setting in. And the doctors would actually have to remove his arm. And like that, an awesome career, promising for a man who loves the Lord, was cut short. Just like that. This was a man who knows suffering. This was a man who could give up, who could grow weary, who could say my strength is gone. Everything I dreamed of just vaporized in front of me. Just like Israel, God, where are you? What is happening? Have you overlooked me? What, what, are you asleep? Have you grown weary? What, why is this happening? I want you to listen to his incredible godly perspective. He went on to famously say this. He said, you know what? In America, Christians pray for the burden of suffering to be lifted from their backs. But in the rest of the world, Christians pray for stronger backs so that they can bear their suffering with dignity and grace. Kind of like Paul. Check out what Paul did. Paul endured his trials with such a spiritual maturity. He says this in verse 9. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. So the power of Christ can work through me. That's why, listen to this, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in the insults, in the hardships, in the persecutions, in the troubles, in the quarantines. All these things that I suffer for Christ. Why? Because when I'm weak, then I am strong. <sighs> Did you catch that? Think about that. Now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. Think about the verse 10. This is why I take pleasure in my weaknesses. Who does that? Followers of Christ do. And that's what we're called to do. So let's get real. During this last 10 days, which feels like 50, how are you doing with handling your weariness? You know, do a little introspection. You know, I like to say, get out your holy post-it notes. If you had to put a put one on your forehead here and say, you know, what what number is it? Four? Seven? Ten? Woo, I'm nailing it. One. How you doing with taking your weariness to the Father? You know, because we're going through it. Sometimes he doesn't take the thorns away, but he does promise to grant us grace and strength to endure it. Uh, sometimes I wonder if we really grasp that. I wonder if we really understand what it means when we're weary and we're heavy laden. We don't have to wallow in, in our weariness. We get the privilege to take it to Christ. That's awesome, all right? So I promised I would tell you some practical application. If you're not sure how to wait upon the Lord, I want you to do these two things, okay? If you're a note taker, get your pen ready. Get your, get your fingers ready if you're tapping away here. If you're not sure how to wait upon the Lord, the first step is this. Stop. Stop. Get alone. Get still. And protect that uh, momentary solitude that you now have. Now, a lot of us have been forced to stop, right? I get it. During this quarantine time, I think this is forcing a lot of people to do it. It's almost like all the idols we had have been toppled. You know what I mean? When you think about it, I mean, like, there's no sports. I can't watch NASCAR. There's... No packed movie theaters, there's no clubs, no packed restaurants to go and distract ourselves, no athletic competitions. All of us can stop now. So to get alone, I'm saying I want you to literally find a safe place. Maybe a challenge in the quarantine time, maybe not. Maybe you have to go to the bathroom, lock the door, or the garage, or, or the shed, out back, whatever. You find a place where you can be alone, and you can have a moment with the Lord so that you can do the second step, all right? Now listen, if you stay in your house, uh, that doesn't count just to say, hey, y'all be quiet for a minute. 
that doesn't lead to waiting on the Lord, what I'm talking about, what we're about to do, okay? If that's the place, then you have to eliminate all distractions. You get away from the family that's in quarantine land, and, and you silence your distractions, your smartphone, you turn off the TV, you kill the Netflix, pull out your earbuds, you silence all distractions, and then you protect this temporary silence as if it were precious, because it is. Then, step number two, you ready? Pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father. Is that it? Pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father. Okay, step one, stop, get alone, and protect that little solitude you have, that little circle of protection, whether it's in the bathroom, you know, your bedroom, wherever you, you can get along. And then number two, I want you to pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father. Don't complicate this. See, we think that's too simple. You know why? Because it doesn't appeal to our pride. When we can get still, we pour out our heart, it has to be more than that. We think, you know, surely it can't be that simple because, uh, God, I, I, I got to do something. See, we like, to, we like to complicate it because it makes us feel like we're doing something. It makes us feel like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll do my part. I'm gonna... You know what your part is? Get before your Father. Let them love you. You know, that's, that's what you want your children to do, right? Come to you, curl up. Mercy came up, hopped up in bed next to me. Put, she curled up right here, put her head on my chest, and she said, I love you, Daddy. And she gave me a kiss. She goes, Mwah. I'm like, oh, what? What do you want, little child? What? Name it. Up to half my kingdom. It's yours, right? If only she knew what that meant. Well, I mean, our Heavenly Father took on familial titles for himself, things like son, in the family of God and calling himself father for a reason. How much more does our Heavenly Father want to love and give us good things than we do with our own? Okay? So I want you to stop. I want you to get alone, be still, and protect that momentary solitude. Second step, pour your heart out to your Heavenly Father. Confess what you need. Confess that you're weak. Just tell God, I'm, I'm, I'm depending on you. I, you know, I'm putting up a brave face in front of my family, but inside, man, I'm falling apart. I'm nervous. I don't know what this world's going to be like in a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Will you give me some peace? And then I want you to spend the next several moments in quiet, okay? Undistracted silence before him. Not you talking. You've done enough of that now. The next several minutes, I want you to be still in his presence and let him speak to you, okay? See, we always think of spending time with God and praying as a monologue, right? Where we just say, God, here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. All right, download it. Got to go. Bye. And we never give him a chance to speak other than maybe through his word. If we give him time in that, if that, maybe the pastor will say something that might resonate with me, but other, you can go straight to the father. And a lot of times we don't stop. You know, we download our list, upload it. There it is. Good. See ya. Stop and let him speak to you because there's a chance he may whisper something to you right then and there. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You're like, oh my goodness, that's the answer. That's what I needed. Thank you, Lord. That's it. He whispers something to your heart, to your mind, right then and there. And maybe he allows that sense of peace and that calmness that you've been asking him for to gently wash over you, which is awesome. And he reminds you that, that you know, he's there, that he is your strength, that, yeah, you're weary. It's going to be. We're in a fallen world. From day one, I hate to, hate to say this, but from day one, we begin our journey towards death and decay. That's okay. This 70, 80, 90 years, this is a blip on the radar compared to eternal life, compared to what's coming. You know, these hard times reveal our character. And he makes us sense our weakness. He makes us, he's, he puts that in our hearts so we go to him. We go to our Abba Father and he'll give us rest. And we get to enjoy fellowship and friendship with God. How cool is that? All right, so as we finish tonight, I want you to hear these words of hope and encouragement, okay? If you're struggling, if you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're all of the above, I get it. If you feel like, you know what, the light has lit this. During this season, you are not alone. He is with you, and I want you to remember that. The enemy wants us to feel alone. The enemy wants us to feel isolated. That's the devil's trick. You're the only one experiencing this. You're the only one going through this. You call yourself a Christian. I can't believe you would do that. That's the enemy. That's the accuser. It's one of his names, the accuser of the brethren and sistren. Don't believe that. You're not alone. He wants to come and overwhelm you. 
But the Lord says, I have you in the palm of my hand, and nothing can take you from my hand, from my protection. Remember, God has a purpose for the pain. He has a reason for this struggle. And he has a reward for your faithfulness. So stay faithful. Stay faithful to the Lord. Keep loving him. Keep loving each other. Keep calling your friends. Keep calling your, your, your neighbors. Check on them. Call your small group people. And I will see you back here Sunday morning at 1030. Know this. I'm praying for you. I'm here. Send me an email. Call me. Text me. Whatever. I might even come back in on Friday and see. If you guys like this, let me know if this meant something to you. I don't want to create a need that's not there. But if this is meeting a need, let me know. Okay? Because uh, we'll, we'll stumble through this. I promise you this. Pastoring like this through a quarantine, this was not taught in seminary. <laughs> so be patient with each other. Be patient with me. We'll stumble our way through this. Um, you know, and if you're a member of another church and you're tuning in, please pray for your pastor, okay? You know, he, uh, he's never pastored through this. This is new. This is not in any textbook. Every one of us are going through something new, okay? So after we dismiss, I'll, I'll close in prayer. Feel free to stick around and keep making comments. Leave your prayer request, maybe scripture verse, anything that, uh, that you want to talk about. You don't have to go home. Well, you are home. So guess what? You can hang out a little bit, okay? And I'll try to, once I sign off, I'll try to hop on as well and, and interact with you as best I can. All right? I love you guys. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this awesome time tonight, how it's lifted my own spirit. And I pray that your peace has descended like a blanket on everyone who has studied your word tonight, not only in Potter's hand, but across the country. Lord, I pray for my fellow pastors. I pray for my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And uh, as they go through this time, Lord, we lift up our first responders, our doctors, our nurses, these people who are putting in so many crazy hours, the truck drivers, the the, the local, the state, and the national leaders, God, we lift them up to you, and we pray that you would pour out wisdom. May they turn to you, God. During this time, as you've broken us, you've broken our pride, I pray that you would, uh, you would just speak peace, and uh, you have our attention, Lord. I pray that you would do something great through this, that you would uh, shine light in the darkness. Use us in some way to be a blessing to somebody this week. That's our prayer together. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. I love you guys. I hope you have an awesome rest of the week, and I will see you online.